I guess that works better if it's turned on. I want to speak on behalf of the family this morning and and just I, I speak for them and express their thanks for you being here today. It means a great deal to them for you to be here to support them. And um, I, it warms their heart. Um, it gives them comfort and it gives them peace as well for your presence being here with us today. And thank you so much for that. Let's pray together. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you so much, Lord, that you're in control. I thank you that your plans are always perfect, and your timing is perfect, even though we don't understand it. But one day we will. But we trust you, and thank you for faith. Lord, thank you for the faith that you give us to trust you. Lord, today we are so thankful for the season of our lives that you have given us, Paul Hensley. Lord, it, it, it was just the most incredible gift for myself, and I know so many in this room that we have had just to know Paul. Lord, to be his friend. Lord, to, to, to be a family member. Lord, to be a church member with him. And we're so grateful for that, and that's why we're here today, Lord. And we celebrate the fact that he is with you, that he is free forever, enjoying your presence, Lord. But today we're here dealing with grief and sorrow, and Lord, I just ask that you would come and minister to every heart in this room today. Lord, as, as we have a memorial service for Paul, as we celebrate his life with us, we invite you, Holy Spirit, into this room, and we thank you for the ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite Walt Pafford to come up and to share with us. Uh, Walt, if you would, please. Pastor Paul. That's what makes this so difficult. But I also loved him enough to know what he would require out of me this morning. So I'm going to step up to the plate and meet the challenge. But I appreciate Kristen giving me an opportunity and the family giving me an opportunity to be here and say a few words. I looked through the Psalms to try to figure out what would be appropriate to say how do you describe a man like pastor paul you know and uh it turned out out of, out of all the psalms that i could find psalms chapter one verses one through three it says blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. I don't know anybody that meditated on the word of God any more than Pastor Paul. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Pastor Paul's leaf will not wither. We are the extension of those limbs. We are the leaves now. We all have to step up to the plate. In the Greek, there's a word, it's called kairos. If you've ever heard of the, if you have not, the word kairos in the Greek means a time and moment in time where everything changes for you and for everybody else. This is a kairos moment for all of us. 
not only for the Hensley family, which are more impacted than the rest of us, I'm sure, but as a church family, we're equally impacted. These three verses describe Paul to a T. I never could call him Paul. I, everybody else could walk up to him and say, Hi, Paul. I could never do that. He was my pastor. But Paul Hensley, our friend and pastor, loved the Lord, and he loved his word. Anyway, it has been said that when God closes one door, he opens another. I'm not going to take long. I'm just going to tell you something that I feel like the Lord revealed to Cindy and I both yesterday during our devotion time. What follows the closed door, what does follow that closed door? I believe another door opens. What does that mean? What does that mean to each one of us? I believe a period of change and transition is coming and is happening as we speak. Even if we do not want to be part of that change, even if we don't want part, even if we don't want it to change, it does not matter. It is here. It is upon each and every one of us. So how we react to it is up to each and every one of us. If we truly trust in God, we must trust in what I call the transition also. Nothing happens in God's kingdom by accident. So through this difficult time, I would encourage you to trust in him, meaning the Lord, and trust the transition. Each one of you is going to have to ask your own, your own self, what does that mean to me? But you're going to have to do it because you can't ignore it. You can walk away from it. You don't have to do anything about it, but you can't ignore it. It's all upon you, all in all of us. I truly believe this is a word from the Lord for all of us at this time. It will affect each one of us differently. We will have to evaluate how it affects each one of us and how each one of us deals with it. If Pastor Paul was here today, I think he would say to all of us, trust God and trust in the transition, trust in God's transition for all of us. I truly believe that's a word from the Lord for all of us. And if I got started, what I would really like to say about Pastor, uh, none of the rest of you would probably have an opportunity to speak because you, there's just there's no end of what you could say. Um, I just hope when I grow up, I can be just like him. Thank you. Pastor. Yes, sir. Okay. Very well said. Thank you, Walt. I want to ask Jonathan Hensley to come up and share with us just the information that probably all of us have read and shared w with the obituary. Reverend Paul Wayne Hensley, age 66, of Waynesville, North Carolina, passed away on March 29, 2024. Paul was born the eldest of three sons to George Robert Hensley and Peggy Vaughn Hensley in Norfolk, England, on November 28, 1957, Thanksgiving Day. In, 19, in 1977, Paul met Debbie Caldwell in Homestead, Florida, and they married on October 14, 1978. Paul and Debbie went to have three girls, Kristen, Mandy, and Stacy. Paul was surrounded by women his entire life, <laughs> as even their animals were female, and he never had a chance. <laughs> Paul's legacy of being a pastor extends throughout his life. He became a pastor in 1986 and has served faithfully as an executive pastor of Life Church of Waynesville for over 27 years. He had a passion for Jesus and people. In addition to his flock, his heart was to serve and support other pastors. Paul was preceded in death by Brother Dale Hensley, 
mother Peggy Hensley, nephew Christopher Hensley, and he is survived by his wife Debbie Hensley of Waynesville, North Carolina, father George Hensley of Fayetteville, Tennessee, brother Glenn Hensley, and Lori Hensley of Spartanburg, South Carolina, daughters Kristen and Mike of Columbus, Ohio, Mandy Artley and Adam of Waynesville, North Carolina, and Stacy Hensley of Newman or Newman of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Grandchildren Parker, Kaylee, and Marlo Wells and Cooper and Newman, nephew Dale Hensley and Sarah, and children of Rogersville, Alabama, Jonathan Hensley and Cindy, and children of Fletcher, North Carolina niece Tiffany Burton and Craig, and children of Mooresville, North Carolina, Brian Hensley and son of Spartanburg, South Carolina, and other family members. Paul was deeply beloved pastor, son, husband, father, uncle, cousin, brother, and friend. His passing was sudden and unexpected, but his legacy left a deep impression on the many lives that he touched. Um, I'm Jonathan Hensley. I'm a Uncle Paul's nephew, um, and uh, I'm honored, I'm privileged. I, um, since moving to North Carolina over the past few years, I had uh, a lot more opportunities to spend with Uncle Paul. Um, every so often we'd get together for breakfast and the laughs were endless and countless. Uh, he had so much joy. He loved and had such a pride in his family and his girls. I could still see his face when he would talk about his grandson Parker and he would just swell. Just swell. I mean, his chest would just, he would just swell. He loved you, man, like no other. If I can say anything about my Uncle Paul, it's that he was a man who was totally and utterly in love with God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He was, for me, the ultimate example of strength and tender kindness that I had the privilege of witnessing in my life over and over again. <laughs> One of the earliest memories I have of Uncle Paul was visiting him with my mom and my brother on our way back to Florida from visiting Nana and Papa. While we were there, Uncle Paul put a movie on for my brother and I, little brother syndrome here. Instead of the norm where big brother got to pick everything we did, Uncle Paul actually let me choose what to watch. And for anyone who's a younger sibling, in that moment, it was probably the coolest thing. I liked them immediately. <laughs> Fast forward several years, and I'm at my father's funeral where Uncle Paul meets my wife, Cindy, who I was dating at the time, and immediately accepted her and treated her like family. <laughs> I can remember sitting in that service, which Uncle Paul performed, and thinking I could never have the strength to speak at my own brother's funeral, and no way I could ever do it as well as he did. Fast forward again a couple more years, <laughs> and when the day came that Cindy and I were getting married, there was no other person that I could think of to perform the wedding than my Uncle Paul. So October 10th, 2013, he came to our home, and in front of God and my family, I had the honor of having my Uncle Paul marry Cindy and I, <laughs> making, me one of, making it one of the happiest days of my life. When both my children were born again, there was my Uncle Paul, just as proud and joyful as if they were his own grandchildren. And again, marking one of the most happiest moments of my life. Last October, Cindy and I were blessed and honored by my uncle when he performed and celebrated our 10-year anniversary service and vow renewal. <sighs> uncle Paul was there for the best moments of my life and literally helped me get through the worst. When my brother passed away a year and a half ago, Uncle Paul was there for me day and night. Not only did he perform the services for my brother's funerals, but he walked me through the past year and a half of extreme pain and grief that followed. <laughs> he never asked anything from me. It's a debt I could never repay, and one I will never forget. I am eternally grateful to you, Uncle Paul. <sighs> Again.
again this past December when our Nana went to be with Jesus. Again, Uncle Paul led the service and guided our whole family through the loss. And I watched him <laughs> stand beside my papa, <laughs> just as strong as ever. Never missed a step. <sighs> There's one last memory I would like to share with you. A few years back, we had a service at my church in Mills River. That evening, my Uncle Pa and I, with hearts open and hands raised, shared in a time of worship and prayer to God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That was my Uncle Paul, a man of strength and tenderness that I know can only come from one place, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Finally, I'd like to share my brother's favorite Bible verse and the one that Uncle Paul shared on more than one occasion. Romans 1, 1, 6. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. God, I thank you for the love of your son Jesus, and I thank you for the most amazing uncle, Uncle Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I want to ask... Susan Ross, the representative from North Carolina Assemblies of God, to come and speak. I bring you greetings today from the North Carolina Assemblies of God, which is a cooperative fellowship with 265 churches right here in North Carolina and 13,000 churches in the United States. Rick Ross, our district superintendent, who, and my husband, who is out of state today, uh, he sends his love and greetings to Debbie, the family, the church family, and friends. I come today also on behalf of the 700 credentialed ministers in North Carolina with the Assemblies of God, one of which is Paul Hensley, our friend and co-laborer. Paul became licensed to preach in January of 1986, and then he went on to the highest level of credentialing in the Assemblies of God ordination in May of 2002. Paul's passion to serve the Lord and to serve others was evident in the everyday choices that he made. He loved the scriptures, <laughs> and he was a student of them. I also bring you greetings from our assistant superintendent, David Crabtree, who is launching a preaching cohort this morning. Paul was signed up for it. He always was looking to improve and hone his God-given skills. And Paul and Debbie were often the first to sign up for events that we offered to our ministers to come together for networking, fellowship. They bought in and were all in on growing and connecting with others. Paul was loved. I heard from a number of our area pastors this week that Paul would just pick up the phone from time to time and just call and say, hey, how are you doing? Just wanted to check in with you. He cared. He was connected. He was compassionate. He was valuable on the state level as well. He served on the 20-member board of trustees for NCAG. Part of his duties in this leadership team was to be responsible for interviewing new credentialees. And the last round of interviews, I got to sit across the table with Paul from several new young couples who were wanting to pursue their credentials. As you might imagine, Paul was thorough in his uh, questions and quick to pray a very compassionate prayer over them at the conclusion of the interview. I loved working with him. 
you know, he always had that twinkle in his eye. <laughs> I think his sense of humor got him through many, many <laughs> of a difficult time in his life. Paul was easy to talk to and always approachable. So I believe today Paul is looking over the rim of the clouds like he always looked over the rim of his glasses. <laughs> and I believe he is saying, make the necessary arrangements to get here to heaven. Don't miss it. Live so as to be missed. He did, and we do. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next, I want to invite uh, Pastor Keith Turk to come up. And um, he's known Paul a very long time, been a lifelong friend, and just so thankful you're here. Glad I could be here today. I want to thank everybody for coming as well. Paul spent a lot of time in this area. I know he knew a lot of people. A lot of people knew him. I go further back with Paul than, uh, than I want to admit that I've been alive. <laughs> we go back a long ways. And I'm not okay today. I'm not okay. Just buried Paul's mom not long ago, George. And, you know, uh, I, I think I said some words at Peggy's funeral that I'm going to repeat today. A lot of times we don't know how to act at a funeral, and words have already been said that refer to that. We don't know if we're supposed to be celebrating or grieving. And I just want to tell you, we're doing both. I'm celebrating Paul because I loved him. And I'm a little bit like you, Pastor. I'm jealous because he finished the, he crossed that finish line before I did. But I know he's going to save me a place at the table. And I'm glad of that today. And, you know, God can help us with this, and I say this more for the family because I know how hard it is for them. Uh, known Debbie and Paul, well, I knew Paul way before I knew Debbie, before they got married. But I've known them ever since they've been married, spent time with them in their home, in I don't know how many different homes, uh, had some funny times. And I'm, I'm remembering a lot of those funny times right now as I'm trying to get my act together right now because emotions. And I'm, I'm a crybaby sometimes trying to get that together. But I'm remembering being at your house, Debbie, back in Homestead, uh, in your townhouse, I guess it was, where we uh, spent some nights, me and Paul, staying up all night long playing probably the very first video game that was called Pong. <laughs> if you remember that, you're old. <laughs> spent several times, almost, you know, hours. And I, how could you spend hours just hitting that ball back and forth? But we did, and then we'd go to work, and we worked together, too, along with George. Me and George were mechanics at, at this place we worked at, and Paul and Debbie worked up in the office and tried to run it. Uh as well as the rest of the employees there. And I remember being at that, that townhouse playing, playing that video game, and Debbie had a cat, and I'm not a cat person. And I don't apologize for that. I'm allergic to cats. And that cat knew that I didn't like him. And that cat would hide and wait to come pounce in my lap and claw me and one day I was there, and that cat did that, and before I knew what I had done, you ever have a reflex action? 
I had grabbed that cat and slung it all the way across the room. And I apologize to Debbie for that because I, I didn't do it willfully. I just did it as a reflex action. And then when I went to leave there that day, that cat was in the back of my, inside my car. <laughs> that cat was of the devil. <laughs> but it's funny memories, and we go back that far. I asked uh, Kristen if I could get Paul's Bible because uh, I learned a long time ago. I've been in the ministry. Me and Paul did a lot of things uh, about the same time and got saved kind of close. I was a little ahead of him. And I, got, I became a youth pastor before I had any idea what I was doing. And I immediately got Paul and Debbie to come help me to be a youth pastor because I needed their help. And they were married, and I wasn't married yet. I was a single guy, and I needed a couple to help me with a lot of stuff. And they were always there through uh, all kinds of things. I could tell some funny stories and mischievous things and whatnot, but they were there and we had a lot of good memories from work, from ministry. And, uh, but I learned that if I could get a hold of somebody's Bible, I could find out some things that were important to them because they would have notes, markers in their Bible and all these kinds of things. And, uh, and Kristen said, sure, I can get that for you. So she did. So I was going over that last night, and, and before I even got to go over it, I had a scripture that popped out I'm going to read to you. Uh, I'm going to be as brief as I can, but I'm kind of like uh, a couple other people said I could say so many things. And Jonathan, you did fantastic, fantastic job talking about your uncle. I could tell a lot of things, but uh, this one scripture came to me uh, out of a particular place in the Bible, and uh, she came up to me and said that uh, something came to her, and she opened her dad's Bible, and there was a marker in this chapter, and it was the same exact chapter that I got something that I wanted to say, and I thought to myself, as I do many times, it's almost like God knows what he's doing. Of course he does. We just catch on a little bit later, figure it out. But I, but I do have this scripture, and I was looking through his Bible this morning and last night, and uh, uh, an amusing thought came to me. I thought, I am reading the writings of Paul in the writings of Paul, because that chapter was one of Paul's epistles, but Pastor Paul had so many notes, and I admired the fact that he could write that much, that small, and you could still read it. It was still legible. And I read a lot of his notes in there, and I thought, man, he was more meticulous than I ever have been. But it was really good. So here's a scripture that I want to share because I want to leave a word with you, just a, a, a particular word. And in this scripture, that's what jumped out at me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 19, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And I just want to say to you that I am so glad that I'm not one of those people. Because I don't just have hope in this life. And if you knew Paul, and, and it was said by his nephew there, if, the, if, the, if you knew Paul, there was anything about Paul that you, you would remember, it was that he loved God and he wanted to do what God wanted him to do and be who God wanted him to be. That in a nutshell, I think, was Paul. He spent most of his life preaching the gospel. Why is that? It's because it meant the most to him. I got saved, and Paul got saved not long after, and we both went through a great transition, uh, uh, an amazing uh, life change, that as I think back about it, we, we were in that Jesus revolution. If you've heard about that movie that's out there, I watched that movie, and I thought, well, that's my life right there. We were on the tail end of that, that thing right there that happened, and I watched Paul change drastically, and I changed drastically. And if, if Paul, I often say this at, at funerals, if Paul could come and speak at his own funeral, which he, I believe he already has done that, 
by all that he has done and who he has been for his life, he's already kind of preached his own funeral. All we have to do is just kind of reminisce about some of the high points and the, the good things that we're reminded of about Paul. But I, I, I told somebody in the family this. I can't remember who, but I, I thought about Paul. I thought, you know, he never was a guy that had a big ego. He was never about, look at me. He was never about, look what I've done and what I've accomplished because he was just about doing what God wanted him to do where God wanted him to do it. And I had often had conversations with him. I said, you know, Paul, you could probably do a lot of other things. You could go a lot of other places. I took a bunch of, I'm a motorcycle chaplain slash missionary, and I took a bunch of bikers over there on a Wednesday night one, one time. Uh, they were having church, and there's a guy with me who's a retired pastor and his son-in-law, uh, he has a son-in-law named Daniel Kalenda, who's a big evangelist guy. And so he's been around a lot of preaching and all this kind of stuff. And he said to me when we left Paul's church that night, he said, who was that guy? He said, he, he may be the best kept secret in the assemblies of God. That guy can preach and teach. He could teach the word. And I said, yeah, that's just Paul, but he's good. He's better than me. Um, but I was proud to hear him say that about my friend. But Paul could have done a lot of things, but he only wanted to do what he felt like God called him to do. He didn't want to go anywhere else. He wanted to be where God wanted him to be and do what God wanted him. Even though he caught, probably could have found greener pastures or bigger opportunities. You know, people sometimes get ambitious but ambition can sometimes take you places you don't really need to go. You just need to be in the will of God. And Paul knew that. So this scripture, it leads to another one that Kristen mentioned. I don't know if she was going to mention this. I don't know what she's going to say. But this scripture jumped out at her in verse 26 of the same chapter. It says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. You know, the thing that we're struggling with here today is that Paul died and nobody wanted him to and it didn't seem like it should have happened. And I was telling my wife when we were driving up here, I said, you know, when we get, when we get up there, I need to ask Paul this question. And then I thought, wait a minute, I can't ask Paul a question. The reason we're going here is to have a funeral for Paul. But I still could not wrap my head around the fact that my friend Paul was not going to be here when I got here. I don't know why I have to say stuff like that and get myself in an awkward position again. But the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Death is that thing that we don't want to talk about, we don't want to face until we have a funeral and then here we are dealing with it. But Paul's whole life was spent trying to get people ready to cross over that valley of death because he knew that God had a plan for us, that God loved us so much that even though death is a reality, we could have victory over death, over hell, over the grave. I asked Debbie last night, Debbie, is there anything you want me to say or do? And she said, preach the gospel. And it made me think, if I asked Paul the same question, he would say the same answer. And if Paul was here and he got to speak instead of me, he would preach the gospel. So I'm going to finish up with this, because you need to know this. The end of chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, beginning in verse 50, says, Now this I say, brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Today, we celebrate Paul Hensley because death has no victory over him. He is in the presence of an almighty God as we speak. He is singing, dancing, enjoying what God has prepared for him and for all of those that love his appearing. And if Paul could say anything to you today, it would be to make ready for that time because God has a place, he has a plan, he loves you with an everlasting love, and he, want us, he wants to take you to that everlasting place of glory where there is joy unspeakable and full of glory. And even though we do have to grieve today, the reason we have to grieve is because I love Paul Hensley, and I'm going to miss Paul Hensley. I didn't want him to be gone. I wanted him to be here. Debbie is going to have a hard time because her husband is not here to help her carry on. But will you pledge with me today to pray for Debbie that God will make a way when sometimes there seems to be no way, that God will do what needs to be done only as God can do it because God is more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think according to what the power that we works in us by Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm celebrating and I'm grieving today and I'm also thinking about the day and it's soon and very soon that we're going to see the King of Glory and Paul will be there to greet us when we get there. Can you say amen to that today? God bless you. Thank you for being here and thank you for letting me ramble a little bit. ready for a revival. I want to ask Kristen to come and share. Thank you, Keith. That's proof that a pastor can get to the point very quickly. So um, thank you all for being here today. I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, the thing I've discovered this week is that there are two simultaneous emotions that believers have. We have grief and we have joy all at the same time, and that's confusing, and it's hard to, to navigate. But today I want to choose joy. So this isn't right. Okay, give me just a second. If you know my dad, you know he was rocking these. We also, we also thought he was trolling us from heaven because he made it snow, and he hated snow. He hated snow so much. Um, I'm nervous. Give me, give me some grace. Um, I would love to be quick, but I'm a pre preacher's kid, so I can't guarantee anything. Um, thank you for loving our dad. That's, the, that's what's gotten us through this week knowing how well he was loved. When we buried my grandmother, I just walked away from that service and I was like, man, Nana loved well and she was well loved. And that's what I hope to be. That's what I hope to take with me. And I thought the same thing about my dad. He loved so well. I told some of the girls last night that they were tiny when, when dad became the pastor of this church and he's basically raised them too. And I said, you know what? I think he loved you guys like he loved the daughters. He might've loved them a little more. I don't know. Um, 
But he loved children and he loved people. He just did. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get through this as um, rationally as I can. Um, but we have an insider's viewpoint to Paul Hensley. We, we knew him as dad. Y'all knew him as Pastor Paul. To family as Paul Wayne. That's Paul Wayne. Uh, I forgot about Uncle Paul. There's a lot of Uncle Pauls flying around. Uh, Mom called him Paulish. I'm not sure why. He called her Boots. I have yet to figure that one out. I don't, I don't get it. Uh, when he became a grandfather, uh, I was 23. I don't know. I remember how, dad, how young Dad was, but he was entirely too young and hip to be a granddad. So he decided he was going to come up with a cool name, and he decided that G. Diddy would be preferable. Um, now with everything going on with P. Diddy, I'm a little worried that did not age well. <laughs> um, but G. Diddy was what we knew him as. He was, he's been G, he'll be G. Diddy for the rest of his life. Um, my daughter couldn't say G. Diddy. It was Judd Diddy. So we got, he got that a little bit too. But um, one of the things that my sisters and I did this week, and I'm very grateful to have my sisters. And so this is our dad, not mine. It's ours. Um, we sat down. We talked about some of the dad things. Like dad, there's a lot of things he did that live rent-free in our heads. Um, and so we were trying to think of all the, the random things that my father did. And y'all probably know it, but the biggest thing was that that man could not dance to save his life. Um, we, I, your shoulders are supposed to rotate, but for some reason he couldn't figure out how to do that. So a lot of it was just the up and down. He tried to comp combine that with the moving of the hands, but it never really, it never really hit. And then he would just use it to antagonize us because we would always make fun of him and we were so embarrassed. We were mortified. Um, he couldn't dance. Um, he'd always eat the English way. A lot of people have said that. It didn't matter if this man was eating chicken, chicken wings. He would use a fork and a knife. He would try to cut these into tiny little bites, uh, which is just annoying. And if you don't bring him a knife, don't, don't serve him if you're not going to bring a knife. Okay? He wants a knife. He's going to cut everything t into tiny pieces. He's going to rest his arms on the table so he doesn't put his elbows up there, but he's going to rest his arms. And he would always give us a hard time. I forgot about this. Stacy brought it up. The, the sissy salad fork. We do not want a salad fork. We want a big fork. We don't want a sissy salad fork. Don't give him a straw. Those are sissy sticks. <laughs> He's going to drink his sweet tea with a, a cup and lots of ice. And if you're her, his waitress, you better be refilling that tea because your tip is going to depend on it. Uh, he taught us all. It's so random. This is the British thing again. He taught us about two-minute eggs. He would get these little eggs that were like poached, and he had a little cup, and then he would slice the toast ever so perfectly into five little fingers, and then he'd dip the fingers into the, into the egg. I hate, I, it's disgusting to me. It was disgusting. I, didn't, I don't, to this day, do not like runny egg yolk, but that, like, anybody that was around our house, like at some point, they were gonna get the instruction on a two-minute egg. Uh, gosh. <laughs> He'd get mad at himself. He'd be working or doing something. Then he'd be like, oh, come on, Paul. Come on, Paul. He would always like, yeah, get it together, Paul. Uh, it's always, it's, it's always going to live, live in our heads. Ah, come on, Kristen. Ah. That's what Dad did. He was antagonistic. If any of you guys know Paul, he was very antagonistic. He really liked to push buttons. Uh, and he always had that smirk. So this picture is kind of perfect because it's kind of there. Um, which I'll get to in a moment, but he loved to annoy his children and his grandchildren. That was like his, his besides Jesus, I think the greatest joy in life was annoying his family. Uh, so, so he would just, he would pick on us. And, and as we're growing up, of course, dad had a very eclectic sense of songs and styles. Um, he loved Neil Diamond. Him and mom would listen to Neil Diamond. We hated Neil Diamond with a passion. Just couldn't get behind it. Can, still to this day, I'll do Sweet Caroline, but that's as far as I go. Uh, man, we hated it. And so he would play it as much and as often as he could. And then he would turn it up because we couldn't get out of the car. We were stuck. And so then we had to listen to Neil Diamond on repeat. And now I, don't, I just don't listen to it at all. I can't do it. Um, the kids were telling me as they got older, my kids used to come down and spend the summer with my parents. And uh, Parker had, I don't remember how old he was. He's a little older, but he had to go to the bathroom. And Kylie told me this. He said he had to go to the bathroom. So instead of like getting to the house, dad would go as slow 
And I was like, yeah, and I'd slam on the brakes and stop. And then he'd go slow, and then he'd slam on the brakes and stop until Parker just got out the car and ran up the hill. <laughs> he, was, he did it all the time. He would just annoy us as much. And he, the more you reacted, the more he would annoy you. And so I'm like, if you just don't let him know he's getting to you, he's not going to bug you as much. But uh, <laughs> we, found, uh, we found a way to annoy him. I mean, we found plenty of ways to annoy him, for sure. Um, we have a little cotton ball on this, on this table over here. It's super random, but he hated the sound of cotton ripping. You know, like the nails on a chalkboard, or like mine's styrofoam. It just makes you cringe from top to bottom. Ugh. His, his little jaw, what he, would, he would tighten up his jaw. He's like, I can feel it in my face. Uh, and he hated, he hated the cotton ripping. So if he was ever annoying us, we'd just grab a cotton ball and just ever so slightly pull it apart right in front of him. Oh, he hated it so much. He would constantly, anybody that's ever served under dad or been in his church knows that he would constantly mess up lyrics <laughs> and melodies. And so he would, he would do, he would try and then he would do it. It would be different every time, but it was actually never right. So the more he would do it, the more he would, he would just get in it. He didn't care at that point. He heard it. He heard it enough, but he could not, he could not get lyrics, right? Drove mom crazy. Uh, I remember in high school, there was this song. Y'all, y'all my age will remember it, but there was, there was a song. He couldn't remember the words. He liked the song on the radio, but the only line he could remember was lying naked on the floor. And so he would, he would bebop around the house, and he would be like, na, 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 lying naked on the floor. Na, 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 na. He could not get it, but he would just repeat that song over and over and over again. Random words, but I guess he'd just remember that one. <laughs> uh, Mom was mostly the disciplinarian. I think drove her crazy. I remember a lot of times she would be like, wait till your father gets home, right? And so we'd get spanked from mom, and then we'd get spanked again from dad. Um, as a mom, I'm like, gosh, that kind of sucks. Like, you just go into work, and then you get home, and all of a sudden you're like, you got to spank your kids. Uh, <laughs> so we had to put the mat on. And, uh, but when we got older, <laughs> dad would... <laughs> He always had a smirk because he's antagonistic. So as we got older, we realized the smirk was the undoing because he'd start to say something and he'd furrow his brow and he'd get real mad, but we could see the smirk. And so as soon as we saw it, we'd point right in his face and we'd yell smirk and then he'd lose it. He would bust out laughing and then we're laughing and then he couldn't hold his mad so we were not in trouble anymore. Like he'd lost all control and all authority at that point. But his dang smirk gave him away every time. <laughs> he had a really hard time in a house of girls. Like, he did not know how to handle things, especially as he got older. It was, it was not something that he was very comfortable talking about. So, yeah, so we'd, you know, sling our bras around or whatever. Dad didn't know. He just couldn't do it. He could not. He was, he was not good at handling that. Uh, <laughs> I guess you could say he was an aggressive driver. Um, I'm curious to know if there's an award for, like, preachers with the most speeding tickets. Because I, I think that he would be top three. Uh, <laughs> he did have a way with words, though, so he got out of a lot of tickets. Uh, he, would put his, he would put his Bible on the front seat, you guys. <laughs> he, he'd put his Bible on the front seat, and then he'd try to sweet talk the cop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, obeying the laws of God were priority, but the laws of the road were just a suggestion. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I remember one of the things that he would always say, and I, I too have inherited the aggressive driver, but um, he would always say, you just got to stick your nose out. You just got to get your nose in there. You just got to stick your nose out. So he would, he would merge without really considering whether other people were coming or not. He would just stick his nose right out. Uh, we were talking about the churchisms. Any of y'all that have sat, sat under him, the very first one that we, we thought of was, this, is it okay to laugh in the house of the Lord? Is it okay to laugh in the house of the Lord? And then he would always bellow, and I'm not going to do it because I don't have the guts to do it this morning, but he would always say, I got joy when I think about what he's done for me, and he would always sing that top of his lungs. Pastor Matt said he'd come into coffee, and he'd, he'd be 10 minutes like, from, from meeting him, but he'd heard him out there singing before he ever got to the table. <laughs> Yeah, we're try I'm trying to think. We're trying to, there's so many churches. Um, so we, we wrote down the fact that he was trying to make the, the sermon short and sweet so we could beat the Baptist to the buffet. He wanted to make sure we were done by noon. 
the, the thing us girls remember most is, in addition to mixing up lyrics to songs, he would mix up like words. Uh, as much as he talked, he would get he would get them backwards. And so there was one sermon, and I don't literally to this day. I know he was talking about Jonah and the whale. I don't remember anything else, but he kept saying the whale of the belly, the whale of the belly. And so the first time we would snicker a little bit, you know, kind of like y'all did. And then he'd say it again, and there's a little more snickering. And then finally, we're all just laughing out loud because he kept saying it, the whale of the belly. And he was serious. He's preaching. He's serious. So finally, he just stopped in the middle. He's like, threw up his hands. He's like, what do I say? He would, he would always do that. He'd, he'd get his words mixed up. He's trying to make a point. And then we would always, again, we, we wouldn't allow him to have it because we'd always give him a hard time. Oh, gosh. Dad was goofy. He loved to laugh. Every, everything that ev- everyone has said to us was that he loved to smile. He was always smiling. He was joyful. Um, I think the same thing about my dad. He's a goofball. I'm like, I, my, one of my sisters was, she's like, we can't put a cotton ball up there. And I'm like, well, dad would appreciate it. This being somber and respectful. Obviously, we respect my dad. We respect, I respect him more than anybody I've ever met. Pastor Matt, you're a close second. Sorry. I feel like I got to say that. Um, no, he's, he's respected, but he, he loved to laugh and he loved joy. And it was okay to him to laugh in the house of the Lord because God is the creator of joy. He's the source of joy. So we're clinging to that, right? We're clinging to the joy. He knew how to be serious. He could, he could be serious. He knew how to turn it on. And it, wasn't a, it was always genuine. It wasn't insincere. But he could go from singing and laughing and goofing off and rocking out with bands and stuff to, to serious. Um, he could talk, you could talk to him about anything. And it's not always easy to do with parents, okay? I remember plenty of significant times that I've disappointed him, um, somewhat defiantly sometimes and other times unintentionally. Uh, but you could talk to him. He was our friend. He'd always say, don't tell your mother. <laughs> he didn't always say that. I'm sorry. He said that sometimes. Uh, but we knew how to talk to him. We knew we could be honest with him. Um, there was never a question he was afraid of. Never any. Stacy liked to push him. She liked to, she liked to push him. Well, well, dad, what about this? What's the Bible say about this? What's the Bible say about it? But he loved the deep discussions, right? He loved, he loved that. And I think it was a challenge. I think he liked the challenge. Um, I don't know that anyone could challenge him like you could, honestly. We're too, dad and I are too much alike. I don't, I don't think I could challenge him with anything that he hadn't already thought of. Um, I remember one time he was like, can't you just learn from my mistakes? And I'm like, no. He was always genuine and sincere. He had a curiosity for the things of heaven. That's one thing I remember about my dad. He was always seeking, always, always reading, always trying to learn more. Um, he liked having those deep discussions. You could tell it just fed his spirit. He loved to have those deep discussions about the things of heaven. He's the wisest man I've ever known. And I'm not just saying that because he's my dad. Honestly, he just, he knew more about the word because he cared. He wanted to know. He sought it out. He knew the word and he knew how to communicate it. And so he loved well. So even when the advice was harsh, it was always easier to receive. Advice, if we carry one another's hearts well, it's always easier to share the tough advice and to give the hard words. And I think my dad understood that. Um, Our dad, sorry. He wasn't perfect. He struggled with things. He struggled with insecurities, with discipline, with focus. Get it naturally. After spending a week with my mom and sisters, I think we're all ADHD. So um, dad was right there with us. Uh, He didn't get everything right. He was always lamenting about being better than he was, but he is the only person I've ever known that I can compare with King David. I've never known someone with a heart of humility like my dad. And he would admit his mistakes. Maybe not right away. I don't want to argue with mom. I'm sure she's seen the side of it that we didn't see. I'm sure that probably took a while for him to admit she was right. Uh, (laughs) But he knew it would go better for him if he did. So he was like, all right, you're right. Um, He had a heart of humility. He had a heart after God. Um, and this humility and sincerity outweighed the mistakes and the insecurities. He sought Jesus. 
He walked with him, and he loved him. When our grandmother was sick, I watched him with a completely newfound admiration. Um, Dad was always the doer and the pastor and the fun guy. My mom was the, the here's what we're going to do, here's, what we're gonna, here's how we're going to do it. She was very disciplined, and, and she, Dad was the visionary, Mom was the doer. But when I watched him with my, with my grandparents, he took on a new role. He took on the role of caretaker. And as much as he has cared for us that have been under his leadership, that wasn't really a, th a thing that I saw in our family because mom was the caretaker. Um, dad, you know, dad, dad care cared for us, but, you know, she's the, the boo-boo queen and she's taking care of the, the hurts and the, you know, she's, she's the practical one. I'm going to worry when I know there's a reason to worry. And, you know, dad was the, the faith. He was the faith. He trusted and, and mom was practical, so she's putting band-aids on and he's the prayer and she's the... You know, and so I watched him turn into this caretaker. And I had never seen that side of my dad before, but it was like not even a question. He just, he, he was over in Tennessee probably more than he was here. He'd leave after church on a Sunday. He'd get back on Wednesday right before service. Um, and I watched him devote his time and attention to his mom and dad in a way that I'd never seen before. There was a softness to him that I think was new. He'd always been sensitive and, and all of that, but there was a level of softness towards his, his parents that I'd never seen. And when we buried her, he was so confident. He got up there, and I, you know, I talked to him, and he was, he was okay, but as soon as he'd start to talk about her, he'd cry. Um, so he, he grieved. He was grieving. The, the beauty of the grief and the joy, right? As a believer, we, we, have, to, we have to figure those out, and that he was confident, man. He, he spoke of her with such love and such confidence because he knew where she was. There was never a doubt in his mind. And although he was sad, he had a peace about her home going because I think that dad understood something about heaven that maybe we have not grasped. And I don't know if we will. I think he had a revelation because he sought after it. So I went to his office this week, um, and I wanted to sit down, and I wanted to be quiet before the Lord, and I wanted to sit. I didn't recognize the office because they'd moved, but it's got Dad's books, so, and his, and his, you know, notes and stuff. And I found all these notebooks that he'd written in. And side note, I, I discovered that he also would start a notebook and never finish it. So there was like half-filled notebooks all throughout his office, and I was like, okay, well, I feel this is where I get it. And he wrote his life purpose. So I, was, I, could, I could read these for hours, but I just found a couple. And I, I found his, he wrote his life purpose in the back of one of these books. And he said, I was put on this earth to carry and impart the very presence of God through my countenance, with my words, spoken or written, and through my hands with healing. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I agree with that. I think we all agree with that because you could see it on dad's face. You could hear it in his words. You could hear it in his song. I think the presence of God was something he saw every day and he wanted to be a carrier, a carrier of the presence of God. I know that my dad's life purpose, our dad's life purpose was to know Jesus and to make him known. And the only thing I think he would ask of us is to do the same. To seek the kingdom. To seek after Jesus. Forget church. I know I'm in a church. We're not talking about church. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about Jesus. Because for dad, it was just Jesus. And he knew him in a way that I'm inspired and challenged to know him. How beautiful it is to speak the words that his life and his countenance impacted so many to where there was never a question. There was never a question. You knew he loved Jesus. And I think about that myself. Do people know? Do people know that I love Jesus as much as he did? And I think that's a question we should all ask ourselves. Like you said, Pastor Keith, I, I want to know Jesus. I want to imitate my dad as he imitated Christ. He wanted more than anything to know Jesus and to make him known. 
in August, I was going through these journals, and this is the Holy Spirit. In August of 1990, a dear friend of my mom and dad's passed away, and dad wrote this after this, this service, after this funeral service. He said, I forgot just how God-loving a man he was. His life touched thousands. One particular impression, he never saw the big crowds. He never became a great name here on earth. However, one life at a time. Here a little, there a little. And in the few short years of his ministry, he made an impact on many. I thank you, Father, for letting me sit under his ministry. He was found faithful. It's the same for us. Only you could never forget how God-loving a man he was. His life touched thousands. He never saw the big crowds. He never became a great name here on earth. However, one life at a time. Here a little, there a little. And in the years of his ministry, he made an impact on many. We thank our Father for allowing us to know and to love and to learn from Paul Hensley. I'll leave you with this. I found this song that my dad had written. <coughs> from the heart of my father to the heart of his father. He says, as time goes on, I realize just what you mean to me. And now, now that you're near, promise your love that I've waited to share and dreams of our moments together. Color my world with hope of loving you. There's coming a time I will appear in the presence of God to receive a crown, a crown for my work. Tried in the fire to test all our labor and works to find out its substance. Honor my life with strength in serving you. It's a hard act to follow. <laughs> I want to speak for just a few moments, and uh, then we're going to have two worship songs, and the, the, this service will be concluded. Um, there, there, is a, there is an unspoken, unpublished reason we are here today. Every one of us. There is a reason that we're here that hasn't been written or copied or on a piece of paper. One word, it's love. It's love. You, you are here because you loved Paul. But you didn't do that but until he loved you first. It's much like the word says about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's been an interaction for every one of us here with Paul Hensley, with Pastor Paul, that that interaction has, has brought you to a point of loving him enough to be here today just to honor his memory. And that's just awesome. Man was full of love. Well, he still is. We can't really speak of him in past tense because he exists more now than he did on this earth. His love drew me to him. I was speaking at a, at a men's event few years ago, and and just a little bit of background, um, for those of you who may not know, my name is Matt Pruitt, I'm pastor here at Faith Community Church, and incredibly honored to do this today. But Paul and I have been meeting every week for 11 years, and and I, I had spoken at a, at a pastor's conference, um, it wasn't a pastor's conference, it was just a men's conference, and and. I had seen Paul around, but he, he came to me, and he wanted to get together and have coffee and, and talk, and there was just something. It was a Holy Spirit that just knit our hearts together just that quick. And I said, let's do it. So we met the next week, and that was 11 years ago, and we've been meeting ever since. Before that, I've been a pastor for 31 years, and, and previous to meeting Paul, I had a prayer 
And this, my prayer was, God, send me a friend. Please send me a friend. And, and, and so I, I, started, I started putting some specifics to it. Send me a friend that is a pastor that has no agenda, that is not competitive, that I can sit down and unzip my chest and take my heart out and share it with him and he with me. There's no condemnation. Lord, somebody that we can have fun with and everything that we share as human beings stay at the table. And, and it's hard, I know, for a lot of people to look at pastors as, as humans, but Christian, you shared the human side of your dad so well, and so much of that I'm, I'm aware of. We would meet, we would laugh, we'd talk about our dogs, we talked about the Lord every time we met. It, it was just awesome. We talked about trips, and I, I was playing in, in, a, in a Christian kind of swamp music blues band, and the only thing we ever played was, was in prisons. And we were playing at Avery Mitchell Prison, and I know he'd ministered there a lot. And uh, this was Christian music, by the way. It just had a good big deep groove line in it. And, and so uh, uh, I invod invited Paul to come, and because he's so prolific with the word, and, and he, just, he could just immediately connect with people. I love that. I said, what I want you to do, they only give us an hour to minister. So, you know, we, we only had like six songs, and we were working things in between those six songs. I asked Paul, I said, I want you to bring the gospel to him tonight, and then I'll do the invitation. So we played songs. We just said, and, and, and I love it. I, I knew Paul was there when I saw him doing this, you know. And, yeah, he couldn't dance, but he could move a little bit, you know. He was enjoying it. And, uh, uh, and so the time came for him to, to, uh, to share the gospel. Eighty-one people got saved. Eighty-one. It was beautiful. It was just absolutely awesome. And we shared so much together, and we just kept it between the two of us. And what an incredible gift God gave me to have a friend like that. We shared our struggles, and we both had them, and at times we had a lot of them. We shared our victories together, and the greatest gift I've ever had, gang. And thank you. Thank you, Deb, for your wife, girls, for your daddy. I thank you for him. Never had a friend like that. Thursday, the day before Good Friday, well, what a day to go home anyway, you know, celebrating Jesus' death. And he gets, I'm telling you, if he was here right now and, and the casket was open, I'd look down in there and I'd say, doggone your hide. <laughs> You got there before I did. I could say that to him. We, we, we had that kind of relationship. But it was really interesting Thursday morning because usually before like Christmas, Easter, holidays and things like that, we would discuss the direction of our messages for, for Sunday. And we bounced a lot of things off of each other. I can't tell you how many messages have been preached from this platform <laughs> of stuff that I got from Paul on Thursday morning. You know, it, I, I hope I was able to share with him the same. It, it was incredible, just an incredible relationship. You know, but on Thursday morning, we, we started talking about Resurrection Sunday and what it meant and, and, and kind of the direction that we're going to go. But the conversation changed. And Paul looked at me across the table and he said, you know, you, you know what it's like when at just random times, God comes and he just drops a drop of heaven in you. And it's ecstasy. And it only lasts for a few seconds, maybe 10, 15, if it lasted more, you couldn't stand it. I said, Oh, yeah, man, I long for that. I don't, don't get them all the time. And they're just, again, just random when it happens. And it's just that drop. He's like, yeah, yeah. 
You know, I think that's what heaven's going to be like when we get there. And it's not going to stop. And just a few hours later, he's in it. I heard the news and I was stunned. I was just stunned. I couldn't speak. I just, it was incredible. But I kept thinking about, he's there. He's there in it. He's in it forever. And, and so with that, there's a lot been shared about him. We could go on until midnight tonight sharing and nothing be the same. But I want to share a passage of scripture to you that was a comfort for me. Uh, the disciples walked with Jesus for three years. They ate with him. They slept. They, they, they camped out. They hiked. They, they fished. They did everything with him. And these men saw Jesus heal the blind, give them brand new eyes. These men saw, and, and Jesus did it out of compassion, gang. He, he would see a lame man, and his heart would break for him. And these disciples saw that. They're falling in love with Jesus. And Jesus would go and just tenderly just give that man his legs back. There was a time that, that they were walking in Cana, and, and this poor little widow woman was there, and she had nothing. And they were carrying the casket out that had her only possession in it, which was her little boy. And Jesus looked at that woman, and his heart broke. And he goes over and just touches the casket. And the little boy comes alive. These men saw that. They saw, they fell in love with him. They heard his words that were just dripping with love and compassion and, and honey and good things and strong things and powerful things. And at every step they took with him for three years, they loved him more. And one day he said something to him. He said, I've got to go to Jerusalem. And there I'm going to be killed. And I think it just went right past them because it was so heavy. How on earth could they? We goes on and we read about it in John chapter 14 that that he's explaining it to them just a little bit deeper and it starts sinking into their heart that he's going to die. This is going to happen. <laughs> this one that we love so much, he's going to die. And so to pick that story up, in John chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus says to them, he wants to comfort them, a little while and you'll not see me. And again, a little while, you will see me because I go to the Father. And then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you'll not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he says? We don't know what he's saying. That makes no sense. You, you, you see me, and then you, you, you won't. Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you'll not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, and you will be sorrowful. That's where a lot of us are today. And Jesus says, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. 
I want to tell you that we can say this same thing about Paul today. We can say the same thing about him. We can't see him now. And we have sorrow and we have mourning. But one day, we will see him along with Jesus and we'll have joy that will never leave us. Amen. Ever. And we look for that day, that drop of heaven that we get to live in is going to be absolutely incredible. I have to do this. I have to share with you how it happens. Paul believed in Jesus. He made the choice to believe in Jesus in his life. And what does that mean? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? We have to go all the way back to Genesis to Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They, they did something God said don't do. It's called sin. And from that moment on, the, the best way I can describe it to you is there's a link in our human DNA that is spiritual. That in our spiritual DNA, there is a link called sin. And it's passed from Adam and Eve to every human being that has been born on the planet. Every human being born on this planet has the link of DNA of sin. Now, Jesus didn't have it because he didn't have an earthly father. So the link of DNA didn't get passed to him. He's the only sinless human that ever lived on the earth. Absolutely human and absolutely God. But all the rest of us, every human that has been born on planet Earth has the DNA of sin. What's the problem with that? Sin separates us from God now and through eternity. There is no way to get to God with sin. You can imagine sin is a wall that cannot be penetrated. Well, I don't want to hear that a little baby is born with it. You may not want to hear it, but it's true. Every human has it. And there is no way to get to heaven, to get to God with sin present. Can't be done. There is an element in the universe that can remove that DNA, that can remove that wall. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. The sacrifice, his blood shed so that when we make the choice to believe in him instantly in heaven, spiritual, it's supernatural. The blood of Jesus is applied and the link of sin DNA is taken out of us forever. Gives us a nature of Jesus that when we do sin, there is forgiveness and it can be removed. So that when we come to the end of our journey, as Paul did on Friday, instantly we'll be in the presence of Jesus. Instantly. So because Jesus lives... Paul lives, and the, the scripture says that when we choose to believe in Jesus, we're not beside him, we're not looking at him, he's not far off. The scripture says we are placed inside him. And if we are placed inside him in his death, guess what happened on the third day, gang? He defeated death. He rose out of the grave. And when that happened and I chose to believe in Jesus, this is better than the Back to the Future movies, okay? It's I was placed into him in his death. And when I chose to believe in Jesus and he rose from the dead, I rose with him. Yeah. Glory to God. If you believe in Jesus, you rose with him and dead cannot hold you. And right now we can't see him. We can't see Paul, but you know what? There's a day coming. I'm gonna run. I, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run my shoulder into his chest. 
and say, man, you beat me here. Right after we was talking about it, you dog. <laughs> Jesus Christ, gang. You've got to have the assurance that you are in him, that his blood has covered you and taken your sin away, and that you will have life forever. That you'll see Paul at the same time you see Jesus. <laughs> now that's a cause for celebration today. Amen. Do we miss him? Hey, Jesus said your heart will be sorrowful. Yes, it's sorrowful. But he said, but you're going to have joy. Ain't nobody can take from you. That's Haywood County. Okay, <laughs> Ain't nobody can take it from you. And I'm so grateful today that death has no power over the believer in Jesus. After 11 years, I guarantee you, when Paul, when Paul was having his heart attack, I believe Jesus was right there with him. Brother, I, I love it when you said he had a smile on his face. Had a smile on his face. I get it. I get it. Just the day before, he said, that little drop of heaven. And at that moment, that drop of heaven was in him. And he had it, and it was going to last more than 15 seconds. <laughs> That's a promise for all of us, gang. Will I miss him? There will never be another Thursday in my life at 9 o'clock in the morning that I will not think of him and miss him and want his presence. God gave me the best gift I could ever have in a friend that I could trust, that I could talk with, and I'm so thankful for him. We're going to end our time together today with, with two worship songs, and Joe, I'm going to ask you all to come up and, and to, to lead us, and then uh, Kristen and Mike will as well.
I'm going to ask you all to stand. I know it's probably weird if you aren't used to church services. Um, it's hard to narrow down a song that Dad loved, um, just like it's hard to narrow down a verse. Uh, the only thing I can think of when I think of my dad, besides his joy when I think about, is just him lifting his hands in, in prayer and praise and singing, I love you, Lord. And so we're going to end this song. We're going to end this service with this song. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, so I'm going to need your help. We're just going to sing, I love you, Lord, because if anything Dad would want is to redirect, he's always going to take it back to Jesus. So we're going to sing, I love you, Lord, and if you know it, sing along. I love you, Lord, and I Joy, my king. Take joy, my king. In what you hear, oh, let it be a sweet, sweet song in your ears. Let's sing it one more time. Love you.
Let's pray. Father, we are so, so grateful for Paul, his influence in our lives. Lord, the love from you through him to us. Thank you for his openness to you, Lord, his outspoken love for you that transferred to us. Lord, thank you for the gift of Paul Hensley. Lord, I ask that you minister to us today, minister to our sorrow, and Lord, minister to our joy. And Lord, let us continually remember the gift that Paul has been in our lives and the things that he sowed into our lives. And Lord, help us to even imitate that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ryan?